Matthew 5, starting at verse 33. Jesus is talking and he says, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the oaths you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil. Thank you very much indeed, Good morning, everybody. Um, and before we uh, turn to Matthew, just a little bit of church family news um, to share over the weekend. Many of you will know um, Beulah and Eduardo. Um, they normally come to the um, 11 o'clock service. Beulah um, sometimes plays the piano for us at the 11 o'clock service. They've been with us here at the chapel for the um, last couple of years. Um, and late on Friday night, um, Beulah gave birth to Eli. Um, who is their, um, their firstborn son. So we rejoice with them, their safe arrival, and um, still in the hospital at the moment. Uh, will be for a few days, Eli, a little bit early, I think sort of three, three and a half weeks early, something like that. Um, but it's doing well. Um, Mum and dad are doing well. I mean, I, whenever people say to me that they've just had their first child, yeah, we're doing really well. I think, yeah, just you wait. <laughs> um, but um, for the time being, um, they're all doing really well. So I'm just gonna give thanks to the Lord that Eli's safe arrival. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, and as we just sung, that you are the one who gives the gift of life. And we thank you for the way that you have um, given life to Eli. And please be with him in these early days, and with Beulah and Eduardo, um, as they adjust uh, to life as parents. We thank you so much for them, uh, for bringing them to be part of our church family here. Please help us to love and support them well in this exciting new chapter for them as a family. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. It would be really helpful if you can uh, have your Bibles open there to page 969, Matthew chapter 5, as we continue to work our way through the Sermon on the Mount. In 11 days, this room will look very different. The chairs will have been completely cleared. There'll be a row of tables down that side. There'll be two or three polling booths set up over on the other side of the room. And somewhere down here, there will be a big black box into which over the course of the day, a few thousand people will come in and place their voting slips. We are now just under two weeks away from the general election, and I can tell from the looks on your faces that you are all pretty pumped <laughs> about it. And you don't get the sense, do you, really, that the nation is enthralled by the election, really? There's a bit more enthusiasm, I think, for the Euros over in Germany. So they suggest that a big reason for a general sense of apathy towards the vote is that people just don't trust that what the politicians say and what the parties promise they will do is actually what they will do. Um, the British Social Attitudes Survey, which began in the year I was born, I'll leave you to guess how long ago you think that might be, but the British Social Attitudes Survey has been taken every year to get a gauge of the, the feeling of the nation on various issues. And that suggests that trust in politicians is lower now than it has ever been. Um, almost 60% of people say that they almost never trust politicians to tell the truth. Now, in defence of the politicians, which is not something you often hear said, part of the problem, I think, is that we expect from our politicians a level of control and power that they simply don't possess. And so people want politicians to make 
promises. They want them to boldly declare that they will do this thing, they will deliver that thing. But most of those things are things that they are simply not in their power to deliver. Because they're not able to foresee events. In many instances, they're simply not able to influence events, to influence outcomes. So no wonder so many of those promises get broken. As Christians, we ought to have a much more realistic view, I think, of how much our politicians, or any human beings, will be able to do. We can praise the Lord that, as the old saying goes, that we don't know what the future holds. We know the one who holds the future. But it's a problem, isn't it, when we can't trust people? And it's a problem in our um, democracy when people can't trust those in charge. And just in general, it is exhausting. Frankly, it is pretty miserable living in a world where a lot of the time we don't know if we can believe what somebody is telling us. It could be in all kinds of areas of life. Maybe it's that letter that must have been lost in the mail that we suspect was never posted. Maybe it's that company that says they'll get back to us with a quote very shortly, but who we suspect we will never hear from again. Maybe it's the friend who cancels because they, they don't feel great, but we worry that actually they just got a better offer. Maybe it's the, it's the partner, it's the husband or wife that leaves the voicemail to say they have to work late again. But we feel uneasy because it's happening more regularly and it doesn't really sound like the office in the background. Trust and truthfulness are precious commodities. And sadly, they are often so valuable because they're in such short supply. Remember how Jesus, in introducing the Sermon on the Mount, gives his disciples a distinctive purpose in keeping his commands. This is back in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. Verse 14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, verse 16, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. As we hear this in this chapter, the commands of the King, so we're being instructed in the values and the pattern of life in the kingdom, and we're being called to a way of life which leads to Jesus' people being a preserving force for good in a rotten world, shining the light of the beauty of life in Jesus' kingdom onto those around us so that we might be salt and light so that people might see so that people might glorify God and here in our passage this morning Jesus turns to show us what that looks like on the subject of truth and trust on the subject of oaths and integrity Verse 33, he says again, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfil to the Lord the oaths you have made. Now, um, I'm from a place called Stockport, which is up near Manchester. And where I'm from, um, if someone was kind of questioned about whether they were really being straight, whether they were really being open and honest, they might well say, Nanny, I swear on my mum's life. People also say, I swear down. Swear down, I did. Swear down, it really happened. Now, I don't really know where the idea of swearing down comes from, but in Mancunian culture, like in most cultures, people are familiar with the idea, however casually, of taking an oath, of swearing on something as a kind of certification that what's being said is really true. Swear on a mum's life. And in Jewish culture, in first century Israel, oaths were quite a big feature of life. As Jesus refers to them there in verse 33. 
Now, unlike the previous commands that he's referred to, um, it's not a direct quote we get from him there when he says, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the oaths you have made. It, rather, it's a kind of way of synthesizing a number of things that God had taught the people through Moses. Because God had given instructions to the people on this whole area of honesty, of oaths and integrity. So, for example, in Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 19, he says, Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. So they were to swear, but not to swear falsely on God's name. In the book of Numbers, in Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2, this is what the Lord commands. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he has said. So God had taught, God had given the people instructions on this area. Now, as with much of the Mosaic law, those kind of instructions were intended to rein in the effects of sin. In a world where people often don't tell the truth, God wanted to provide the means for people to be bound to keep their word so that people would tell the truth. Ways of ensuring, really, that people kept the ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness. And so God gave instruction to encourage and to ensure truth-telling. Even when we all know that people, including us, are not always naturally inclined to do so. But once again, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had taken God's instruction, instruction intended to rein in the effects of sin, and they had turned it into a kind of contrived system of twisted words and loopholes, which instead had the effect of justifying and permitting sin. They concocted a sort of fingers crossed behind your back way of dealing with oaths. You'll know this sort of thing if you've ever been in a primary school playground. Miss, he said, if I, if I lick that stone, I could have the packet of crisps, but now he won't give them to me. <laughs> nah, miss, I have my fingers crossed so it doesn't count. Well, it was a bit like that for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Some oaths were binding, but some oaths weren't. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is addressing his disciples, but actually later in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 23, he directly addresses the Pharisees. And he says there some things to them which give us a bit of insight into exactly this issue. Let me read a few verses. This is Matthew 23 and from verse 16. He says, Woe to you blind guides! You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and the one who sits on it. Do you see what they've done? They, they have this system where, for example, swearing by the temple didn't count. If you promised something to somebody, you said, oh, I swear by the temple, I will do that for you. That didn't count. The oath wasn't binding. But if you swore by the gold in the temple, then that was. You, you, you were supposed to do that. Likewise, if you swore by the altar, ah, that's a kind of fingers crossed sort of oath. You don't actually have to do that. But if you swear by the gift on the altar, well, that's different. It's the kind of man-made, false, tick-box, technicality-driven righteousness that Jesus has in mind when, back in uh, Matthew 5, he says, But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, 
for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. In the Pharisees' eyes, swearing on Jerusalem, not binding. Swearing towards Jerusalem, binding. And so on. Like a sort of twisted religious eye, you should have read the small print. And it seems that that was based around the, the idea that they'd concocted that some things counted as the Lord's and some things didn't. So going strictly by the wording that Jesus used in verse 33, do not break your oath but fulfil to the Lord the oaths you have made. Ah, the Pharisees would say, but if something isn't the Lord's, then you don't need to fulfil to the Lord that oath. And therefore the oath that you've made is not an oath that you need to keep. But Jesus tears up the small print. He says there is no, this is a God thing, but this isn't a God thing. So this oath counts, but this oath doesn't. Whatever you swear by, Jesus says, you're swearing by God. You're swearing to the Lord. Again, in verses 34, 35, 36, that's the point he's making. Do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem. For it is the city of the great king, that is, it is the city of God's king. The heavens are God's, the earth is his, Jerusalem is the city of his king. So whether you swear on it or you swear towards it, it doesn't matter, Jesus says. You swear to the Lord. Even if you swear by your own head, verse 36. Who is, who is sovereign? Who's in charge of that head? And even the hairs on it, Al mentioned it earlier. Not you, Jesus says. You don't have the power to make one of your hairs white or black. God is. It was utter foolishness to think that anything they might swear by was theirs to swear upon, apart from God. No, 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 Jesus says. God is witness to every oath they might make to every oath we might make. Jesus says there's no loophole. There's no loophole for lying or, or breaking your word. They turned oaths from something intended to bind people to their word, to instill a culture amongst God's people of real trust, of real integrity. They turned that into a system that allowed people to, to wriggle out of their world, to justify dishonesty and slippery talk. But Jesus exemplifies and Jesus demands a surpassing righteousness, remember? Matthew 5, verse 20. I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter. The kingdom of heaven. The, the kingdom is characterised by a surpassing righteousness. And so the people of the king must live out a surpassing righteousness. Which means displaying a genuine commitment to truth. To consistent honesty and thorough integrity. And so Jesus says it shouldn't be necessary for you to give some sort of verbal indication that what I'm saying now is true. Sometimes we do do that in English, um, don't we? We can say things like, can I be honest with you? And it's a strange turn of phrase, that, isn't it, when someone says, can I be honest with you? Because it makes you think, huh, what have we been doing up until now? But Jesus commands his disciples that real honesty and integrity ought to simply be a constant. Verse 37, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. The evil one, Satan, is the father of lies. And so anything less than a simple, straightforward truthfulness, Jesus says, comes from him. With a kind of disarming and challenging clarity, 
Jesus teaches his disciples that no oath is needed. Your word should simply be enough. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Simple. Simple. But of course not easy. Not when we know how instinctively we lie. Not when we know how naturally we fudge the truth or we exaggerate or we say yes to somebody's face knowing that we really intend to say no later but we can do that via WhatsApp. Truth and trust is a precious resource because it is in such short supply. But friends, remember this is Jesus' command to his disciples who are his disciples, not by virtue of their righteousness, but by virtue of their repentance. The Sermon on the Mount is the pattern of kingdom living for grace-dependent disciples of the King. But as forgiven failures, we need to battle against falsehood in our lives. We need to strive with the help of God's Spirit for real integrity, to be reliable, to be honest, to be people of our word. And so what will that mean? What will that look like in practice? Well, let me say, firstly on that, don't think courtroom or becoming an MP um, when it comes to, to what it means to apply these verses. Um, People have spent a long time historically in these verses worrying about questions like, should a Christian ever swear an oath um, on a Bible? So for example, uh, if they're going to be a witness in court or if, they, you know, if you become an MP in Parliament and you have to um, swear on the Bible. So some groups like the Anabaptists, um, who are quite a significant Christian group in the 16th and 17th century and whose thinking still has um, influence today, they, they excluded themselves for such things. If you're an Anabaptist and you witness a crime, you, they wouldn't go to court and stand the witness because they would say, I cannot swear. I cannot swear an oath. Um, I don't think the complete outlawing of oaths in that kind of context uh, is Jesus' aim here. I don't think that is primarily what he has in view. In fact, Jesus himself speaks under oath at his trial. The Apostle Paul, at points in his writing, invokes a kind of oath when he says things for particular emphasis. He says things like, as God is my witness. Christians can speak, I think, under oath, as long as they speak truthfully under oath when required. But the point is that an oath should not be required for a Christian to speak truthfully. Because we should just be speaking truthfully all the time. And so instead of thinking about the very unusual situation of the, the courtroom, we need, I think, to be thinking about the typical. We just need to be thinking about the everyday. We need to think about what it will mean for us to be people of real, dependable truthfulness in our marriages and in our families. Doing what we say we will do. Not making promises just to keep somebody happy in the moment even when we've no intention, or maybe even no ability, to keep that promise. And being people of real, reliable integrity in our workplaces and in our communities. Being the kind of colleagues and neighbours who others know will be honest with them, even when that's being honest about our own mistakes. Being people who others know won't seek to mislead, to protect ourselves or to gain influence or curry favour by protecting our mates or the, the powerful. Sadly, of course, the church has been much damaged by a lack of integrity in, in that way. Hiding the truth to protect vested interests. We ought to be people who can be relied on to tell the truth even when that's costly. And even when it's not what people want to hear. 
Let your yes be yes, and your no be no, and your I don't know be your I don't know, and your I can't do that by that time be your I can't do that by that time. Now it's worth saying there's a difference between being honest and being blunt and rude. Just because something is true doesn't necessarily mean it needs saying. But we need to think every day. And therefore we need to think making honesty a habit. Um, which means I think we need to really sweat the small stuff when it comes to letting our yes be yes and our no be no. So easy, isn't it, to just tell the little lies. To say, oh, they didn't have it in the shop, instead of, I, I just forgot it. To say, yeah, I, I, I've done it, didn't you get the email? Oh, I'll, I'll resend. Instead of, I'm really sorry, I haven't done it yet. To say, I'll talk to your mum about it later, instead of, no, you're not going to be doing that. We may not swear by the gold of the temple, but we need to be aware of our own little loopholes for lying. And in submission to our Saviour, we need to keep working to close them. Because finally, we need to think salt and light. In a world of rotten lies, shrouded in darkness and deceit, in a society starved of people that can be relied upon, Jesus' people ought to stand out and shine brightly as people of real integrity, real truthfulness, real trustworthiness, as people whose lives reflect the God they serve, the God of all truth. Now that is a reputation long earned and quickly lost. So let's just turn, shall we, and take a few moments of silence and pray that God might help us. Let's just take a few moments. Heavenly Father, we are conscious when we look at the perfect honesty and integrity of Jesus. And that there are ways, big ways and small ways, in which we have failed and to be people of truth, to be honest with others. Please forgive us, Heavenly Father. We thank you that we know that you stand ready to forgive. That Christ has paid the penalty for our failures and our falsehoods. And Heavenly Father, as people made righteous in him, please help us to strive for a Christ-like righteousness. Please help us to really battle, uh, to be people of integrity and truth. People whose yes is our yes and whose no is our no. Please let me us, us be um, friends and family members who people can turn to, knowing that we will be honest and reliable. Please let us be colleagues and neighbours and who people know that they can trust. You know, Heavenly Father, that we, um, we battle in one sense against our own sinful instincts. And so please, by your Spirit, um, help us to grow more and more in Christ-likeness in this area. 
we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.